Okay, we're finishing up Matthew chapter 7. We just went through true and false prophets. Now we're going through true and false disciples and the wise and the foolish builders. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. That's the scariest words in the entire Bible. I can't think of any scarier words. Because part of the Bible teaches clearly that only those who can say, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. And now it's saying the opposite, somewhat. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, I'm going to pause here. If you're not going to enter the kingdom of heaven, where are you going? You're going to hell for all eternity. That is why this is extremely serious and important. If you're not going to enter into the kingdom of heaven, there's only one other place you could go. When I was Catholic... They don't really do this anymore in Catholic churches, which is funny. They used to teach about purgatory. Because Catholics clearly taught when I was a child, you enter heaven through your works only. They were literally no better than um, Jehovah Witnesses or uh, Mormons. Mormons totally believe in works. The works you do on this earth will determine whether you go to heaven or not. Catholics would teach a, a different way about purgatory. There was heaven for those who, you know, were perfect. Then there was purgatory for those who were believers, but not yet quite good enough to enter into heaven. So you waited in purgatory and did penance for however long. I used to ask the teachers and the nuns, well, how long do you have to stay in purgatory? They said, oh, we don't know. The Bible doesn't teach that. It's going to be different for every single person. And I say, well, what determines if you go to purgatory or you go to hell. Oh, well, only people who have committed, who have died in their cardinal sins go to hell. Cardinal sin is a sin that was unforgiven before you died. See, Catholics, when I was being raised, they don't teach this like this anymore. Which proves that what they were teaching was wrong before. Catholics said, when you're dying, you need to have a priest come. See, we just went through true and false prophets. Catholics taught if a priest does not give you your last rites, you'll go to hell. But if a priest gives you your last rites, you go to purgatory. But they can't tell you for how long or what you're going there for. They can't tell you any of those things. But the word purgatory is nowhere in the Bible. It's not taught in the Bible. So you're either going, not everyone, not everyone who says to me, now this is Jesus saying this, He's making a prophecy here. Most people don't think of this as a prophecy. He's prophesying on the last day, Judgment Day. He's telling you exactly what's going to happen on Judgment Day. And anything that's told about the future is really a prophecy. Not everyone who says to me, says to me, Jesus... 
Lord, Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Well, here we go. Who or what is the will of the Father in heaven? It's so simple it will blow your mind. You say, okay, what is the Father's will? How can I do the Father's will the Father who is in heaven, how can I do his will so that Jesus will accept me into the kingdom of heaven? Where do I get that list, my going to heaven to-do list? I need my going to heaven to-do list. That's what Mormons do. That's what Jehovah Witnesses do. I need my list of good works to please the Father to get into heaven. That's 100% false. And the only way you would know that is if you studied the entire Bible several times on your own and you really got a good hold on what is required to get to heaven. Now listen, or if you just believed, okay, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Well, what is God's will? What is the Father's will? What is the Father's will? Question mark. What does God say? This, this is my son. See, it's easier than you realize... Well, I'll say the answer is easy. God made the answer easy. This is my son whom I love. Believe upon him and you shall be saved. Period. The end. Everything else is good works after you believe in Jesus. But what this is talking about here is people who are bypassing Jesus and doing the good works to get to heaven. These are people who skipped like the Muslims. The Muslims do the good works. Yes, Muslims have a lot of good works in their belt. You'd be surprised. Muslims have probably more good works than most American Christians. They're doing the good works to enter into the kingdom of God, but they're not doing the one required, believe upon my son, Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved. And second is the good works, where you're working for crowns and everything. That is why, that is why, baptism is not a requirement for salvation. Baptism is only a public Admission that you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. See, let's go on. Many, many will say to me, Jesus, on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, doing good works, and in your name drive out demons, doing good works? And in your name, perform many miracles, doing good works. Then I, Jesus, will tell them plainly, I never knew you. <whistles> then I, Jesus, will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me. You evildoers. Why is Jesus, the Lord, the King of Kings, calling people who are doing good works on earth evildoers? Because you're doing it outside of the requirement of the Father. The requirement of the Father is first. Step number one, believe upon my Son, Jesus Christ, and then you shall be saved. Why is Jesus 
casting these people away from him on judgment day after they did all those good works. I never knew you. I never knew you. I did not know you. I have no idea who you are. Why? Because you skipped the first step of salvation. What is that? What is the first step of salvation? But only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. That is the first step of salvation. What does God say? This is my Son, whom with I am well pleased. Okay, here's the requirement. That's still not a requirement. God's just saying he's pleased with his Son. That doesn't mean anything for salvation. Believe upon him. Oh, now we have a requirement. Believe upon Jesus Christ. Believe upon the Son. And God says, and you shall be saved. God says, this is my Son whom I'm well pleased with. See, God is showing his authority over all of us. God is saying, I have all authority. I need you to do this, and then I will guarantee your salvation. This is my son, whom I'm well pleased with. Believe upon him, and you shall be saved. That is the will of of God the Father in heaven. But what about all these good works? They don't mean anything. Well, now, wait a minute. How did they prophesy? If they're not with Jesus, and they're not Christians, and they're not saved, and they're going to hell, it clearly states they're going to hell, how, do, how are they able to prophesy, drive out demons, and perform miracles? How are they able to do that? In the name of Jesus Christ. That's how. Do you realize that what that is saying? That even non-believers, even non-believers can use the most powerful name ever written, Jesus Christ, the most powerful name in on heaven and on earth, and do perform all those miracles? Even non-believers can believe in that the name of Jesus Christ will drive out a demon or... Now, you can listen to the radio, these late-night programs, and they talk about ghosts in demons or evil spirits in old houses and stuff. And they have these um, mostly women go in there. Like these women who believe in horoscopes, numbers, numerology. They go in there and they drive the demon out of that house and it never comes back. And they're doing that not even in the name of Jesus. So if you're wondering how could they do all these miracles in the name of Jesus? Well, when Jesus went to the man in the tomb, a man who no one could bind, not even with a thick metal chain. Yes, they used to have metal back then. He would break the chains and go around town naked, harassing people. Jesus walked right up to him and spoke to the demons inside this man and said, Who are you? They came running out. They said, We are many. We know who you are, the Son of God. Please do not throw us back into hell, into the abyss. Jesus commanded them to be quiet 
and stop telling people who he was. These demons were so fearful. When Jesus showed up, they were many. They called themselves legion. Now, how they got out of hell and got attached to this man through some sinful activity, I don't know. They were scared to death that Jesus was going to throw them back into hell and all the suffering. They begged Jesus. They begged him, please do not send us back. Oh, that ought to tell you something about hell right there. That ought to tell you about how horrible hell is when the demons are screaming, please do not send us back there. They said, send us into the pigs, the nearby pigs. Jesus said, go. He told them, go, you can go into the pigs. A filthy thing. Demons going into filthy pigs. The Jews thought pigs were filthy. He said, go. The demons went into the pigs and the pigs ran down into the nearby water and drowned themselves immediately. So how are these people who Jesus is saying, let's go over it. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, 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 Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name drive out demons? And in your name perform many miracles? These people are very angry. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Whew. Away from me, you evildoers. Why are they evil? Because you and I are also evil before we became saved. We were enemies of God, evil. So why are they being called evil? It's very simple. They skipped the number one step of salvation before they started their works, their good works. It'd be like getting in a car saying, I'm going to drive across the United States of America. Someone gave me a million dollars and I'm going to go across the United States of America performing good works for people. But you forgot the number one step. You didn't take your car to the mechanic to see if it would even make it 4,000 miles across the United States. You forgot the number one step. You didn't get the car checked out first. Now that's just an example. So now check this out. Here we go. This is the um, really gold nugget, the golden nugget in here. So if they are not performing all of these works in the name of Jesus, that's why they keep saying, in your name, in your name, in your name. But if Jesus says, I never knew you, you weren't doing this on my behalf. Now, I added that in, but think about it. Stop and think about it. You were not doing this on my behalf, so whose name were they doing this in? To whose glory, now we're getting deep here, we're getting deep. To whose glory, to whose glory were they trying to get their own glory, their own name? You've seen these do-gooder people. 
A good example is like really rich multimillionaires showing up at like an, an auction for local artists. It's really just a farce, a big farce at best. And they show up and they're like, they have these dinners and it costs $99 to get in and support the local art community. And they're saying they're going to auction off the art. And, you know, the really super rich people are looking around the room. I'm not saying anything bad about rich people. I'm saying about this certain situation that I know exists. And they're looking around the room and, you know, people are looking at them and, you know, who will give $1,000? Can we start the bidding at $1,000 for this, this drawing of a stick man? <laughs> blah, blah, blah. And a guy raised his hand, I'll give $1,000. All of a sudden, they're selling a drawing of a stick man for $27,000 because the guy wants the approval, the guy or the woman who's a multimillionaire wants the approval of all the people in that community. And that man is well known in that community for being a great, great, you know, um, supporter of the arts, the fartsy artsies. Seriously, your child could draw a stick man. Okay, so now this person gets $27,000. No, everybody wants a piece of that action. Now the people holding the dinner get 20% of your $27,000. Now the IRS wants part of your $27,000. The local state wants... Now you say, what are you going to do with your $27,000? I'm going to use this to create more art. And they ask the man, what are you going to do with this stick man you know, painting? And he says, I am such a great man. I'm going to donate this to charity, to the local art museum, because I'm a multi, multi, multi millionaire, and I do not need another picture of a stick man in my house. And everybody, oh, oh, so great, so great, so great. You're so great. Here's the point I'm making. Whose name are they trying to glorify? Whose name are they actually trying to glorify here? Their own name. They are trying to glorify their own name only. They are trying, they are seeking, they are seeking their own glory. But if you're standing in front of Jesus Christ and it's time to to, to decide in the next few minutes whether you're going to heaven or you're going to hell. And Jesus might say to you, I never knew you away from me, you evildoers. Because they, if you're not doing good works in the name of Jesus Christ, who are you doing them in? Your own name. I've had Mormons tell me, Mormons really high up in the Mormon church. Now I'm talking about locally, not I'm not talking or statewide. I'm not talking about in the Salt Lake City. I've had um, top line Mormons say to me that they are collecting good works so when they die, God will give them their, I'm not making this up, it sounds crazy. They believe they're going to be given their own planet and all their family is going to live with them. And I say, that's not in the Bible. They say, you're right, it's not in the Bible. But let me tell you a secret about Mormons. They're just like Christians. They don't read the Bible. They don't even read their own book of Mormon. Because the world in the United States is so confused now. 
Nobody who claims to follow God even reads the Bible or even their own book. I know it sounds sad, but I'm telling you, if you're not doing these good works in the name of Christ, whose name whose name are you doing them in? Your own glorification for your own glorification. What did the demon say to Jesus? He says, what is your name? He did not say, what is my name? They said, we know who you are, the son of God. They said, he's, Jesus said, what is your name? They said, our name is Legion, for we are many. So somehow they got out, they attached themselves to this man, and did they use their freedom to do good works? No, they used their freedom to terrorize, to terrorize that entire area and the, the nearby towns. Jesus cast them out immediately. The man came and was in his right mind, came immediately and fell at the feet of Jesus and begged, let me follow you. This man was suffering under this um, this demon possession. He was suffering, and he was telling Jesus. Jesus says, "Go and show yourself to the local, you know, priests and um, rabbis, and go show yourself. Go go into town and tell of the story that God has done for you, saving you." See, in that way, in that way, because everybody in that town knew who this man was and how possessed he was. Everybody in that town knew it. Everybody knew. So if this man shows up completely in his right mind saying, God has healed me, how many hundreds of people are going to instantly believe in the name of Jesus and become saved, you see? Now, I want to go through this one more time. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Because we went down here, false prophets. We just went through the um, false prophets. Now we're going through false disciples. The false prophets, they claim everything in the name of Jesus, but they are false. Now there's many reasons you can become false, but I'm just going over the number one reason. You skipped the first step of God's authority. You ever see a new assistant manager at a job? Not the manager, an assistant manager. And one they took off the street is the worst of all. Now, if you get someone who's been working at the company for five years and they get promoted to assistant manager, they're probably going to be mostly okay because they're not going to start pushing people around that they've been working with for five years. But you get a brand new assistant manager off the street who's never worked there. He doesn't even know how to do the job. But they're like, as soon as we train him, he's going to be assistant manager. And you're going to have to immediately start doing what he says or she says. And people are like, oh, geez. The guy or the gal shows up the very first week. They become power hungry and they, they immediately start trying to change the whole system at your job. That's a false prophet, you see. They're doing this for their own greatness. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Okay, once again, what is the will of the Father? Now, common sense or humanness tells you 
okay, the will of the Father is to go out and do good works. That's not true. That comes second. The will of the Father is to believe upon the one that God sent. Believe upon my Son, and you shall be saved. Anyone who passes that step, anyone who surpasses the first step, now listen, I want you to hear this. Anyone who passes the first required step, it's not the first step, it's the first and only step. All the good works you do in your life will amount to nothing in the eyes of God because you skipped the first step. And that's what I meant about the assistant manager off the street comes in. The assistant manager doesn't want to be trained. No, he wants to pass, go past the training and go right into having authority over everybody. The same thing with Christianity here, Christians. Not true Christians, but false Christians, false prophets. And that's another reason I believe people, true Christians cannot lose their salvation because their name is written in the book of life. And Jesus said very clearly, anyone's name who's written in the book of life shall never lose your salvation. This is why, especially in America, we confuse the truth. We think people can lose their salvation in America. Is be why? I'll tell you why. Because we have all these false Christians organizations in America claiming to be Christians for Jesus Christ, but they were never saved in the first place. So are these Christians true and false disciples? Are these Christians, are they really true Christians? And Jesus is saying to them, I'm going to have you lose your salvation. Get away from me. I never knew you. No, he's not saying that. Because the words, I never knew you, that means you were never, ever a Christian for Jesus. This group of people never were Christians in the first place, even though... They went around telling every single person door to door that they were true Christians. Wow, that is so profound. And what do we have in the United States of America today? Now, in other countries, if you say you're a Christian, you probably are because saying you're a Christian in another country might mean you're going to be killed. Like in China, Russia, the Middle East, if you stand up and say we're Christians, you're actually putting your life in danger. But in America, if you say, oh, I'm a Christian, there are true Christians, and then there are Christians that just say they're Christians to put it on their resume so they get a job or. They, their name gets glorified or, or they get built up for doing good things in the community. What does Jesus say? Listen, this is very important. I never knew you. So these people that were doing all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, they were never actually true believers to begin with. And that's why I just made this um, I just proved if you skip the first step and you are not saved through Jesus Christ and the blood of Christ, every single thing you do in your life after that will give you zero credit. You might get credit amongst men. You might get credit, you know, in the charity organizations. 
You might receive rewards, but when it comes to judgment day and salvation, there is no power there. You have no power. No one has any power. Only the name of Jesus Christ, the blood on the cross, has power. And if you are not covered by that blood, it doesn't matter what you did after that. It does not matter. If you are not covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, all the good works in the entire world will amount to Jesus looking at you and saying, I never knew you. I never knew you. And then he tells the angels, away from me, you evildoers. He tells the, he's saying away from me, you evildoers. And I'm saying at that point, I believe angels will pick those people up and cast them into hell. Yeah. And you will never get out. You cannot pass go. You cannot, this is not a game of Monopoly. You cannot pass go. You you will not collect $200. You will not get a get out of jail free card. It's eternal. Hell is eternal. Now you're sitting there doing all these good works as a Mormon. I had a Mormon tell me, well, we're all going to get our own planet. I said, well, that's not in the Bible. They said, but it's in the Book of Mormon. I said, okay, well. So who's going to be on your own your planet? Now they believe each person's going to get their own planet and become a godlike person. I say, well, who's going to be on your planet with you? They say, our entire family line. This is what the Mormon church teaches. Our entire family line, my grandparents, my children, everybody, my grandchildren will all be on my planet. And I say, well, let me ask you a question. It's so obvious the Holy Spirit gives me the wisdom to say this, you know. Well, how can they be on your planet if they got their own planets also? And the woman who has been a, a Mormon for 60 years since birth, she looked at me and said, well, I, we don't know everything. I mean, if, if you get your own planet and your children get their own planets, and now there are enough planets in the, in the um, universe to have one person on every planet, sure if that's what God wanted, wouldn't everybody just be on one planet by themselves? And you wouldn't be with your family at all under the Mormon teachings, false teachings. And the lady said, you know, I've never thought of that. I'm going to ask whatever she called my Mormon representative at the church. I'm going to ask him that question. Because it disturbed her so much that she was going to get her planet and her children were going to get her planet. I said, what about your husband? Is he going to be on his own planet and then you're going to be on your own planet? And that really disturbed her that she would not be spending eternity with her family. But they claim Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, but they do not claim Christ as the King of Kings. They claim Christ as a brother along with Lucifer, the devil. They're both just brothers, and one brother was good and one brother was bad. Not, I'm going to finish this up. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Now, what is God's will? This is my Son, whom I love. Believe upon him, and you shall be saved. If you don't separate that away from everything else, 
that salvation can only come through faith and not through works. Salvation can only come through faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Then once you are saved, you cannot lose your salvation if you're, if you're truly saved and your name is written in the book of life. Well, what about good works? Good works come after that. Now, if a person becomes saved and never has any good works ever after that, they're still going to go to heaven. You say, well, how is that possible? Well, maybe they got saved three minutes, three minutes before they died. And they didn't have time to do any good works. But you, I'm going to get really technical here. Salvation itself is the number one good work. People don't put that together. Salvation itself is a good work. But salvation has to be separate because we are saved by what Jesus did on the cross. See, salvation is Jesus on the cross, the blood of the Lamb. We went through this in um, Revelation. And only by the blood of the Lamb can you be saved. Nothing you personally will do can save you. And that is why they said here, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name, drive out demons, and in your name, perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. They skipped the part about becoming saved, and they went straight to the works. Jesus told the um, man who came to him in the middle of the night, Unless you are born again, you will never see the kingdom of God. You have to have the blood of Christ covering your sins, or Jesus will look at you on judgment day and say, I never knew you, because his blood, his blood decides, his blood alone only decides who goes into heaven and who does not. Now, the good news is salvation is freely available to anyone who asks. All you have to do is ask. Jesus says, anyone who comes to me, I will never turn away. But it does not say these false Christians went to Jesus. It said they were just performing works in his name. And I showed you in the Bible, people would perform works and drive out demons in the name of Jesus, but they weren't saved. What about the teachers and the Pharisees and the top line Jews? They were um, doing all kinds of stuff in the name of Jesus every single day. In the name of, not Jesus, in the name of God. You see, here's what it is. I'm going to switch gears for a second so you understand it in a different way. As a man, I believe that I can save myself. Especially in our society, American society that if you want to eat, you better get off your butt and go down and get a job all by yourself and start working and bring home some money so you can eat. Yes. Or even you even have to go down and fill out 30 pieces of paper to go on welfare. We are taught in this society that every single thing I'm going to receive in my life is going to have to be through me working or me figuring out a way to get an income that's flowing towards me for doing very little work. But I still had to figure it out and set it all up. 
So when God comes and says to mankind, evil mankind, the only way you can be saved is not of ourselves, not you can't do anything to be saved. Only my son, Jesus Christ, and the blood on the cross can save you. So the devil comes in and tells those people, now what did God really say about salvation? And pride, pride takes them over and they say, full of pride, what do I need Jesus for? I got this. I can go directly to God on my own. And let me tell you, frankly, my friends, that that is the problem in the last 2,000 years. I can go to God outside of the cross, outside of Jesus Christ. God sacrificed his son for the sins of the world, and now about 50% of people want to go past that. You see, it was... It was um, at best, crude and stupid at best, for Joseph Smith, the founder of the Mormon church 150 years ago, for him to even suggest that God the Father and the Son appeared to him and gave him a new revelation and a new book on how to be saved. Just think about how stupid that is. He announced God the Father, Jesus Christ the Son, and the Holy Spirit appeared to me personally, Joseph Smith. I'll tell you what it was. Joseph Smith was a man. He was a psychotic man. He had psychotic issues. He was crazy. Yeah, oh yeah, definitely. He came up with this. He said, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit appeared to me and gave me the Book of Mormon, an entirely new revelation on how to receive salvation separate from Jesus Christ. And there's only been about, I don't know, less than like 30 million Mormons worldwide. 50 million in the last 150 years, a very small amount. So you think if God actually did appear to him, then there would have been hundreds of millions of people becoming Mormons. Just like there's been one, two, three billion people becoming Christians in the last 2,000 years. So, God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit show up 1,900 years later to just Joseph Smith. Now, the guy was a con artist, and I explained that in the False Prophets. He even believed in his own con. Yes. He talked hundreds of people into getting into covered wagons in Missouri and going west. The people there hated him so much they were driving them out of the town. He didn't have a choice. They were chasing him to kill him. That's the kind of false things this man was telling people around him. Not all of it's written down. This guy was doing some pretty creepy things as far as God's concerned. Now listen. But only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven shall see or enter the kingdom of God. What is that will? Jesus Christ. That's the um, straightest, simplest way to say it. Jesus Christ is God's will. There was God, and then he begot his only son. And then he got the angels through his son. 
That's why the angels are a little lower than the sun. Lucifer was one of those angels. Lower, he was an angel lower than the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Now, he's called many things, but we call him Jesus Christ, you know, in English. Everything else is below Jesus. So for you to come along and say, hey, I performed all these miracles in the name of Jesus. And God says, or Jesus says, I never knew you. You didn't come to God. Now, this is important that we're going to end it up here. You did not come to the Father through the narrow gate, me, Jesus. I am the narrow gate. Jesus is the narrow gate. We just went through that like two Bible studies ago. The narrow and wide gates. I, Jesus, the Son of God, I am that narrow gate. You cannot go to the Father except by coming through the narrow gate, Jesus Christ. And just to put it plainly, just imagine you're going through this gate, this narrow gate, Jesus, and when you go through the gate, you're sprinkled with the blood of the Lamb, and all your sins are forgiven, and then you can go on through to the Father. But to suggest, to even suggest, I can go to the Father on my own. Foolish. At best. A person, and I'm telling you, that's what... um. Mormonism is, Jehovah Witness, that's what Buddhist, Buddhist, Buddhism is, Hindi, all, all the snake charmer um, religions, that's what um, Muslim, Muslims do not say you need Jesus, and Muslims do not even say you need Muhammad. Muslims say Muhammad is only an example of how you get accepted by God. They do not say you have to go through the perfect prophet Muhammad. No, they say he's just an example. Muhammad lived a perfect life, so we need to live a perfect life, and then God will accept us and give us, like, 77 virgins or whatever it is in heaven. Well, that's curious because I don't know what you're going to do with the virgins in heaven because in heaven there's no sex. But that's only what the Bible says. They reject what the Bible says. Now, if you speak to a, a Muslim, they will tell you the Bible has many good points that we can all agree upon. But the Bible rejects every other teaching. So the Muslim may, might say, well, the Bible has a lot of good points. But you have to tell the Muslim, no, the Bible teaches that we cannot accept anything you say. So I will end here. Salvation by any other name. Any other name other than Jesus Christ is false. You will not be saved. Now, I will prove it to you, and then I will quit. Look at this. Lord, Lord, on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord. Who are they talking to? Who are they talking about? They're talking about Jesus Christ, King of kings, Lord of lords. They are standing there. There's a figure standing there, and they are talking to this figure. 
Who is it? Who are they calling Lord? It's not Muhammad. It's not Joseph Smith. It's not Buddha. It's not reincarnation. Who are they talking to? I'm proving to you whose name you have to have to be saved. Who are they talking about and who are they talking to? Lord, Lord. Did we not do all these things in your name? Who, who are they talking about when they say your name? They're talking about Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the only begotten Son of God. You can't even say the Son of God because people say, well, there are many sons of God. No, that's not true. We will all be sons of God during the 1,000-year reign. I mean, those who are saved, the church, yes. We will be more than that, actually. We will be like him. Just a little above the angels, just a little bit, it says. And just a little below Jesus. But who are they talking about when they say, Lord, Lord? What they're doing is they are admitting the only way to get into heaven right now on this judgment day and the only way to stay out of the, the fires of hell on this judgment day is this person we're calling Lord. Lord, Lord. And see, so this person that they're calling Lord, Lord, they're recognizing that he has ultimate power. He has ultimate authority. Whatever he says is going to happen. He's not a middleman. He's not, you know, the middle guy they sent down to collect your, um, your fees. No. He is in heaven and all the angels are there. And he is standing there in all his glory. And they recognize, wait a minute. And they're approaching him with confidence. Unfortunately, false confidence. They're saying, hey, this is going to be easy. I did all of these good works in the name of Jesus Christ. They are saying, Lord, Lord. Who are they talking to? We in America, we call him Jesus Christ. The only begotten son of God the Father. Given he was seated at the right hand of the Father and given all authority over everything. But he's always had all authority. He is God himself, so to speak. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all one God. So in these people, they are recognizing if, if the Lord, Lord, Jesus Christ, whatever he says right now, that's what's going to happen. And they find themselves in the worst position you can be in in the history of the world. The history of all creation. Just like Adam and Eve, it's the same thing. The devil said, did God say, did God say you would really die? I'll tell you, you're not going to die. Oh no, you're just going to live in hell for all eternity. I would rather die. I would rather be no more ever like I didn't exist than spend eternity in hell. You got to be kidding. If those were my only two choices, 
I would take extinction. Nobody is going to want to spend eternity in the lake of burning sulfur for all eternity, no. But you don't get the choice. It's either heaven or hell. And they skipped the part about faith. They went right to the works. I'm going to work my way to heaven. And now they're standing in front of Jesus Christ and he says, I never knew you. You don't have my blood on you. You do not have my blood covering you. You have not had your sins forgiven and you have not been made white as snow. And let me tell you, I'll end with this. Because good works cannot forgive sin. Good works cannot wash away sin. The issue, the number one issue is sin. S-I-N. The number one issue is sin. The reason you cannot get to God the Father goes back to the Garden of Eden. God said, do not eat the fruit from the tree in the center of the garden or you will die. He meant physically and spiritually. But a lot of people aren't going to die today because of the rapture is right around the corner. They're going to be raptured and they will not die. But God said in the Garden of Eden, if you eat the fruit that I commanded you not to eat, you will die. So Jesus Christ came down to conquer and defeat that death from the Garden of Eden. And to defeat sin once and for all. But it's not automatic. See, the, the issue is, God is so holy and perfect, you cannot be near God's perfection and holiness in your filthy sin. You can't have it. It, it cannot exist. Light and darkness cannot exist in the same space. Meaning, God's perfect light and the darkness of death and sin cannot exist in the same space. If you want to go to God, you have to have 100% of all your sins washed away, clean, forgiven, thrown into the sea and remembered no more. So God, before the creation of the world, he made a way for us to be forgiven. That's why he got his son to begin with. He knew when he created man, because God is all-knowing, he knew in advance they're going to sin anyway. Just like when he created Satan, he knew Satan was going to come against him. But he gave him a free will choice to not come against him. He gave Adam and Eve a free will choice to not eat the apple and sin. He gives you and I a free will choice to get our sins forgiven through Jesus Christ. And 80% of the world is going to say, no, thank you. There are many ways to heaven. I'm going to pick one of the other ways outside of Jesus Christ. I'm going to pick a different way, my own way. People say, 80% of the world says, Christianity is not the only way to heaven. Well, you don't even have to think that way. The Son of God is the only way to get to God the Father. That's why God says, this is my only begotten son. There's only one way into the kingdom of God according to Christianity. But these people said, hey, 
I'm going to do it on my own. That's what the Mormons and the Jehovah Witnesses say every single day. The Jehovah Witnesses clearly teach that Lucifer and Jesus are only brothers and Jesus is not part of the Trinity of God. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. They don't even um, believe in the Trinity. They believe in three separate parts, the Father and the Son, and then the Holy Spirit is completely separate. They don't even believe in the Trinity. Jehovah Witnesses do not. So on that last day, my friends, it really didn't matter what you did if you were not covered by the blood of Christ to begin with. You see on the video camera here, they're taking a bunch of fish in those blue tubs, those big, huge blue containers up, up here. to the. They're just a small fishing boat. They're taking those up to the market to have them weighed and um, sell them, and that's how they make their money. I don't know how much they get. They might have $10,000 worth of fish in there. But imagine them trying to take those blue containers upriver without a boat. That's what you're trying to do with God. You're trying to get to God without the sun. It's impossible. Because you... You see, you go back to the Old Testament, the blood... The, the blood of a sacrifice of an animal was required once a year to forgive all your sins. God told Abraham, sacrifice your son, but then he stopped him because God's Isaac could not, uh, you know, the blood of, excuse me, the blood of Isaac could not forgive all the sins of future mankind. So God sacrificed his only son, Jesus Christ, on the cross for the forgiveness of your personal sins. But you have to take the step, you see, because God requires one thing. Believe. Believe upon my son and you shall be saved. Without that one step, you will not be saved. Believe upon my son and then you shall be saved washed perfectly washed clean white as snow by the blood of Christ and then God will accept you for all eternity once you have Jesus you have everything for all eternity and that's why I'm saying you cannot lose your salvation because once you truly have Jesus, no one can snatch you out of God's hand. The problem with American Christians is we have a lot of false prophets and false Christians going around claiming salvation, so then you see them falling all the time. But they were never saved in the first place. So you think, hey, I wonder if you can lose your salvation going up and down like a teeter-totter or a seesaw. You must be able to lose your salvation because I know people who were saved and now they're not saved. They lost their salvation. But I'm telling you, here's the greatest proof right here. They never were saved because Jesus says clearly, I never knew you. I never, 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 never knew you. What does that indicate? I'm getting kind of excited here, to be honest. What does that indicate? It indicates that God is saying, or Jesus, Lord, 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 the King of Kings is saying, I never knew you. You were never saved. Jesus never said, well, ten, if you'd have died 10 years ago, you were saved, but then you fell away. But then if you'd have died again, like three years ago, you, you were saved again. But now you're not saved because you fell away again. Don't you see how that doesn't make any sense concerning God's plan? 
God says, believe upon my son, Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved. Final, permanent. You cannot lose your salvation. I know people who believed upon, believed upon the Lord Jesus Christ when they were 20 years old, and then they went out and did drugs and all kinds of pornography and things for 20 years after that. But I'm telling you, they never lost their salvation because they were truly saved at one point in their life, but they slipped back into the world. But now God is using that person who was always saved because even when they were into drugs and pornography for 20 years, if you ask them, do you believe in Jesus Christ? They'll say, yes, I do believe in Jesus Christ as my Savior. They were saved. But we, in America, we like to judge people and say, well, there's no way that guy could be saved. Haven't you ever heard of the prodigal son? The prodigal son... The prodigal son was saved the whole time. Even when he left. Because he said, I know if I go home to my father, he will at least give me a job. But what did the father do when he came home? After all those years of sinning, the father ran and threw the robe of authority around him, gave him the ring of authority on his finger, and reinstated him to the position of the son, S-O-N. How can you be reinstated if you were never in that position to begin with? No, the prodigal son was always the son, but the world got a hold of him and made him sin just like Adam and Eve, they were always God's children, but the world caused them to sin. It doesn't mean they stopped being God's children. Talking about Adam and Eve. No. This, these people I'm talking about who did drugs for 20 years and pornography or whatever... They were still saved. If they died at any time, I believe, just by believing in Jesus Christ, they would have gone to heaven. They would have had very few um, crowns in heaven. They wouldn't have had any works to take along with them. But we're not talking about that. We're talking about salvation. And that is, the world has a huge problem with people who are saved... And then they go out, then they go out and commit sin after salvation. Well, you might as well go back to Adam and Eve because they sinned also. I don't know why this is so confusing to some people. Your sin does not take you away from God after you become saved. I mean, it's probably a sin to eat a cheeseburger and french fries today, but I might go actually have a cheeseburger and french fries. That's not really a good way to eat. It's, not, it's a sin. All sin is against God. Every sin is against God. So how can you say that I'm saved? How can you say... You know, let's say, uh, I, I don't know, I go to Walmart and all of a sudden the Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders show up and, and walk in front of my car. As a man, I'm going to say, whoa, why are all those girls half naked? That's probably a sin. You see? Did I lose my salvation? Did I automatically lose my salvation right there? If you are saved and you go over to your neighbor's house and punch him in the nose because you're angry, 
Maybe the guy slapped your wife on the ass or something. Your wife walked by, the guy slaps her on the behind. And you're like, oh, no, 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 no. And you go over and punch the guy in the nose. Did you lose your salvation? No, you never. Well, why not? You sinned. You just committed a sin. There you go. Jesus said, I never knew you. Meaning, they were never saved to begin with. They were never saved. They weren't saved, and then they lost their salvation. And then when they were saved, then they lost their salvation. Then they were saved, then they lost their salvation. You know, it talks about during the tribulation, if you take the symbol or the seal of the beast on your hand or forehead and you bow down to worship him so you can buy and sell products like food and water. It says you can never be saved. But that also means they were not saved to begin with or they would have been raptured. That's about all I got to say here is um, true and false disciples. I was going to finish chapter 7, but I, I'll have to do it next time. There's, We'll go to the wise and foolish builders next and talk about that. The only way to get to heaven is through Jesus Christ's faith. Jesus said to them, these people... And honestly, I'll just use myself as an example. These people that are talking to Jesus probably did a hundred times more good works than I will ever do. They probably did so many good works it puts me to shame. But by the blood of Jesus Christ, I get to go to heaven for all eternity. And by rejecting the blood of Jesus Christ and doing it their own way, trying to get to God their own, on their own through pride, they will get to spend eternity in all in hell, the lake of burning sulfur for all eternity. That is the only difference. And once you are saved, once you are saved, you are free to go out and do as many wor good works in the name of Jesus as you want to. You're free to do good works in the name of Jesus. I was listening to Dr. McGee. I'll give you the, um, I'll give him credit. Vernon McGee. He's an old timey pastor. He's, he's gone now. He died in the 80s or 90s. Dr. McGee is probably one of my favorite preachers. He said, if you want to know about me, ask my enemies. He said, ask my enemies what they think about Pastor McGee. He said, now he was living in Calif Southern California for the majority of his uh, ministry. He said, if you want to know whether Dr. McGee is saved or not, go down to Southern California and ask the Democrat liberals, that's what he said word for word, ask the Democrat liberals what they think of Dr. McGee. He said, they will tell you they hate me with a passion. They hate me. They hate everything about me. They hate the fact that I'm a Christian. He said, if you want to know who a man truly is, ask his enemies. He said, if your enemies speak well of you, you're probably not following Jesus Christ. He said, if your enemies speak badly of you, ill, I-L-L, -L, ill of you, in the name of Jesus, you're probably doing pretty good. Uh, every single person who knows me that I know of knows I'm a Christian. They have my whole life. 
every one of my friends. When I got to be like 30 years old, I looked up every family member I had and their address, and I looked up every friend I had back at age 20 when I was drinking, you know, beer off the farm and acting crazy. I sent every single person I knew a Bible with a note on it that said, it's me, Dave, I'm a Christian now. Well, I said, that's not what I said. I didn't say I'm a Christian now because they knew I was a Christian before, but I sent them a personal note telling them about Christianity and following Jesus and that they should start reading their Bible in case they die. I only heard back from one person. I think I sent out about 40 Bibles. I only heard back from one person. And that person did not believe in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. All the people that knew Jesus never said a single word to me. Only one man who was one of my best friends who did not know Jesus one way or another. I mean, he was a pretty good guy. I mean, he was a nice guy. I called this man about eight years ago on the phone and I did not know at the time I must have been guided by the Holy Spirit. The man died about three years ago or four years ago, and I called him eight years ago, to, and we talked in the middle of the night, and I, and I was talking about Jesus and things, and he listened. I don't know if he ever became saved, and then four years after that conversation, he died at age 56. He was only 56 years old. He was one of my best friends. He died of like out of liver disease or whatever. This guy drank a six pack of beer every day since he was like 15 years old. And he said, no, he says, I've lived a good life. I've experienced a lot of good things and don't worry about it. I'll be fine. <laughs> well, I don't know if he's in heaven or hell. I have no idea. And that was a man I've known since I was 19 years old. I've never personally heard him confess Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. And he never did a lot of good works either, actually. He just kind of lived his life. He took care of his mother. He never got married, never had children drank beer, went to work, came home. And then I called him in the middle of the night to rattle his cage. I was playing a joke on him. I was trying to see if he could guess who I was because I hadn't spoken to him in like 15 years. He could not guess who I was. Well, I finally told him. He's like, what the heck? No way. And I told him about my life and Jesus and, you know, my wife and what we were doing. And so he did get the message. Oh, he got the message. But who knows what happened the next day? I never spoke to him again. There's only one way to avoid hell. So think about it this way. There's only one way to avoid hell for all eternity. And not by yourself. And you cannot go directly to God the Father. If you are playing Monopoly, you cannot pass by Jesus and go directly to God the Father. You cannot do it like in the game of Monopoly. You cannot do it. You must go through... Jesus Christ and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross as the, the sacrificial lamb.
the Lamb of God. You must go through that stage or you will never see the kingdom of God. And Jesus says, I never knew you.